Good morning, everybody. Here is a new presentation of the colloquia from the Severo Ochoa project at the Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalucía. Today, we have the seminar of Dr. Frank Eisenhower, and he will talk about Gravity Plus, which is a all sky high contrast milliard second optical interferometric imaging and spectroscopy. Dr. Eisenhower will be introduced by uh, Isabel Marquez, our scientific director. Isabel. Hello, good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming here to our online Severo Ochoa Colloquia. Um, I hope you, you are all well. And um, so it's a pleasure today to have uh, Frank Eisenhower. Um, and uh, I, I'll make just a, a brief bio of him. Uh, Frank Eisenhower is, is senior staff scientist at the Max Land Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics, the MPE, in Garhin near Munich, where he's leading the development and science exploration of large astronomical instruments and, and experiments. Two of them, Symphony and, uh, and Gravity, are part of the instrument suit employed in the discovery and characterization of the Galactic Center Black Hole for which Professor uh, Reynold Gensel and Professor Andrea Guess has been awarded with a, a 2020 Nobel Prize in Physics. Um, following his studies of physics at the Technical University of Munich, he started his ma master and PhD thesis with Reinhard Gensel at the MPE, where he continued his scientific career today. And just to take the opportunity to congratulate Professor Reinhard Gensel, who is uh, uh, among our audience today. So um, our congratulations to him and thanks to, to being part of the audience. It's uh, an honor for us. Uh, uh, Frank Eisenhower is author of uh, about 400 publications with more than 60,000 citations with an H uh, index of 64, in particular 43 in, uh, with more than 100 citations and more than a dozen uh, with him as first or colleague author. He has also strong experience as a, as a teacher. Uh, in fact, since 2011, he has been adjunct teaching professor at the Technical University of Munich. And uh, he has also been supervisor of PhD thesis at the International Max Planck Research School of Astrophysics. Over the years, his experimental focus moved from adaptive optics imaging to integral field spectroscopy and now optical infrared interferometry, always with the goal of uh, ever better understanding of the physics of black holes and their environment. Uh, today, he will talk us about the Gravity Plus, uh, all sky high contrast millisecond optical interferometry imaging and spectroscopy. Welcome very much, uh, uh, Frank, and uh, welcome all. Thank you very much, Isabel. Thank you very much for your kind invitation. Also to you, Rainer, for establishing the contact. It's a real pleasure for me to be with you and the honor to, to present a few views from my side. And well, let me also applaud our local laureates, Rainer this year, Andrea, Roger. Fantastic, fantastic for our field, fantastic for all of us. So, our talk today is about gravity and gravity plus. Actually, I will spend my talk a little bit wider if you allow. And so, but I'm not giving it actually myself. It's a talk which is for the full collaboration. And indeed, we now have two collaborations because I will report on two things. I will report on the ongoing project, which is gravity, and our plans and project, which we have for the future, which is gravity plus. And so the gravity collaboration, so we are six institutes in Europe, in Portugal, in Lisbon, in Porto, then in France, in Grenoble, Paris, and then here in Germany, in Cologne, and here at MPE, and together with ESA. And so you see we have about a good hundred of or so scientists and engineers who have made this, this gravity experiment. And so what we are going on, and so what you now see is, is the new setup for the upgrade we want to do, which is called Gravity Plus. So we, we are setting up a, a new collaboration, which is to a large part the, the same institutes involved, but we also have new partners. And so for example, if you look on the lower, lower right, so we have Laura Reitberg, who was appointed director in the Max Planck Institute in Heidelberg. And this year, we have the, the British joining with Sebastian Hünig from Southampton, and also within France, we are expanding. So we have the NIS group, so this is the Observatory Lagrange on the top. And we have the Nidifrea with his ERC grant joining now from University of Liege. 
So we are a big group. Indeed, this slide is, is very new. So we are setting up the collaboration as we speak. And please apologize if I'm still missing a few pictures. The team is growing every day. So now this is the overview of the talk I'm giving. So what I'm going to pass is really we, we are encountering a revolution high in better resolution astronomy. We now get images at three milli arc second resolution and the sensitivity a thousand times deeper and fainter than what we could do before with interferometry. And so I will report on the results, fantastic firsts of gravity on black holes on exoplanet spectra and on active galactic nuclei. But then I will also talk about the instrument, which you see in the middle. This is the beam combined instrument, gravity, and our plans for the future, this is gravity plus. And then I will talk about, and it's what you see on the, on the lower right, what we hopefully will discover very soon with the upgrade we are doing. Because as I said in my, my short, before actually the talk started, we want to go yet in fact a hundred deeper than what we can do today. So let me give a little introduction actually to the talk by, by a picture which I, I think is, is a Spanish um, philosopher, Ramon Lull. I understand he. So he's from the Middle Ages, and, and so he had this organic picture of science, and from him is coming this term of a tree of science, and I, I interpret it as a tree of astronomy, and with this organic picture of, of science, we have a foundation which is, is the roots for us, it's, it's the theory of Newton, you can see, and then the, the plant grows, the tree grows, and you you have a trunk, a backbone, which for us astronomy are telescopes, which you see on the lower left from, from Galileo. And then you have the different branches of the, the astronomy we are doing. And, and if you're lucky, and this is what you see, in the, you, you get fruits, fantastic fruits. And I'm showing these three fruits, which are linked to interferometry on the lower right, radio interferometry. On the top left, the gravitational waves interferometry. And on the top right now, what I will talk about is the the optical infrared interferometry. And indeed, it's also this analogy with the tree is not so bad because it, it takes a while until science or astronomy actually comes to fruition. And it takes, if you have a forest, you know, it takes a hundred years to, to grow a forest. And so it was with these two experiments, which you see here. So on the left side, between the Michael Morley experiment, where you in the two arm interferometer. They could measure the speed of light to the gravitation the waves with light on Virgo. This was more than a hundred years. And so it was with, with optical interferometry. The early work from so Stefan and Michelson was in the 1890s. And again, more than a hundred years later, we see the fusion and here gravity in this case. So why took it so long for us? You can see if you compare it with the radio astronomy. So on the lower part, you see the timeline of radio interferometry. So in, after the war in 1952, so there was the first demonstration of a two telescope interference. So, so this was in 1952. And then it took only 25 years, after 28 years, the VLA, so this, this large array in the US, which was put into operation. So why couldn't we do so fast? The optical infrared. So Michelson measured the diameter of the moons from, from Jupiter in 1890. Now it took 126 years until we arrived to make the VLTI work together with gravity. And so this is the explanation for it because it's so much more difficult in the infrared or the optical compared to the radio. And you can take the numbers yourself, but the bottom line, what you should take away, it's a hundred thousand times of that order harder in the optical infrared than in the radio. And this is because we have to stabilize everything to the wavelength, which is a 10,000 times smaller. The coherence time of the atmosphere is 100,000 times smaller. The throughput is less of our optics. We have much smaller telescopes. So all of that makes it incredibly harder. We also gain a little bit because black body radiation gives a lot of photons in the optical, but this doesn't make it up to me. So it's so much harder, and this is why it took a hundred years for us to get there. And so now I'm showing you a, a few of the tricks which we had to do with a fly through the instrument. And so what you now see here is you follow the photons through the instrument which combines the light from the telescopes. And since we have to combine all of that to nanometer accuracy, we have to stabilize all our optical beams 
to that accuracy. And we do that by control loops. So we have a, uh, more than a dozen control loops. We look on the light, which is coming from every telescopes. We analyze it. We have adaptive optics, which stabilize the image from each of the telescope. And then we control with laser beams and some of the control you see here. We control the beam, which is arriving in the instrument. This is all to prepare interferometry. The interferometry itself then also needs additional preparation because we still have to adjust that the light arrives at the same nanometer. And this we do with optical fibers. So what we do is we feed the light from the four telescopes into optical fibers and then you can stretch them. By stretching the fibers, you can find adjust the path length. You can also twist the fibers, this is what you see here, and you twist the fibers to align the polarization of the light. Otherwise, it would also not interfere. And so after you've prepared all of that light, it comes together in Michelson interferometer. And in our case, the Michelson interferometer is not a, a two-arm with a beam splitter, but we implement all of that in, in a little de device, which we call an integrated circuit. And this is what you see here, integrated optics. It's the equivalent of an electronics integrated circuit, but we do it with waveguides. And so we mix the light, we form the fringe, in the end you go through a spectrograph, and you get the interference in the spectrum at the same time. This means you get an image in the spectrum, like medical field spectroscopy. So in short, what we then can do is, and this is what you see in this presentation, is that we build nothing less than the, the largest optical infrared telescope. So you, you put the telescopes together, and then you have a diameter of 130 meter, where you can combine the light, we have a 200 square meter collecting area from the big telescope, so we can look on faint objects. And what we have is, we are a thousand times more sensitive than all the interferometers. Excuse me, my animation didn't work as it should. So we have an angular resolution of a few milli arc seconds, and we can measure the position of stars relative to each other to, to a 10 micro arc second. And then you can do science, and this is just a, a few of what I, I will touch on. So these are the gravity force. So in the last three years of operation, we could address many fields of astronomy. Actually, in terms of observing time, most initially was going into the studies of star formation, stellar physics, what is touched here on the lower left. But what I will talk about in the next minutes is actually a few other things. I will talk about exoplanet and spectra. I will talk about the black hole in the center of the galaxy, and I will talk about massive active galactic nuclei. So let me start. Let me start actually with the nearest ones, with the exoplanets. This was not really on the screen, but it should have been actually, because here what you see, it illustrates the problem. So these are two, two images, direct images, of how exoplanets look around nearby star. On the right side, formal law. On the left side, PDS 70. And you notice two things. So the exoplanet or exoplanet candidate, in that case, is over here. And PDS 70 is here. You notice two things. It's not only contrast. So you have to suppress all of the starlight. This is what you see on the right. Actually, that there's all of what you see here is, is light from the star, which is scattered to where the planet is. But also what you see on the left side, actually you, you should be sharp because especially if you go to the young planet formation, then the planets are embedded in disks and actually you need to distinguish what is a planet and what are concentrations in the gas where it's building up as waves or shock fronts. So you need resolution and contrast. And interferometry does that and gravity does that. As I said, we are 20 times sharper than what you can be with the biggest telescopes. And so let me come to, to two examples. So by now we have observed of the order 10 planets. And the two I want to touch on is this, this multi-planet multi system, HR8799. It's what you see on the top right. And what you see here is, a, is adaptive optics imaging. So you see the planets rotating. And what we now add with gravity is we, we measure the position of the stars very precisely to a few 10 micro arc second. For all of them, and this is illustrated here, so you, you get the orbits of the planets. And, and so indeed, 
if you see, look here, so this is the depth of optics data, milli arc second resolution, um, a few milli arc second precision accuracy. If you go to gravity, then we come to a few 10 micro arc second. So you really have to zoom in by a factor 100 to see our upper bars. And then what you can do is you can measure the, the, the orbits. And indeed, the measurement of the orbits can also give you the mass of the planets. We are not there yet, but soon we will get that because the, the heavy planet is actually shaking the star. And, and so the, 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 the other planet is orbiting around. Um, if you measure the, the position between the two, you see the imprint of the, the shaking of the star in that separation. And so we can measure. The, the, the masses of the planets in the future in these multiple systems. On the lower, on the top left, we see in other um, very famous systems, this is the better pick system. And so what you see here is the, the planet going behind the occultation from the depth of optics imaging so this is a coronagraph. And again, we could put gravity onto this, to this to this planet, and what we do is we do spectroscopy and we use the interferometer kind as a lock-in amplifier. We can very nicely distinguish the light which is coming from the planet from the light which is coming from the star. They have a different fringe frequency, interference frequency, would call it. And from that, you can derive a spectrum, what you see here. And so you see beautifully the CO absorption lines. And the CO is a very important aspect in the understanding of planet formation, because it tells you where the planets form. The idea behind is planets can form from either dust, which comes together, it's called a core accretion, or you can, can have the gas collapse. Mm. And you can distinguish if you now measure the ratio of carbon and oxygen, and this is illustrated on the right side, so this is a, a figure adapted from Eberg. What is important is, that if, if you're far enough out, then, then you freeze, you get snow, and you get grains. And if you have snow, actually in the snow, you see in the water snow, it's obvious there's no carbon at all. But even in the carbon dioxide, there's only one carbon for two oxygen. But in the interstellar medium, it's mostly a CO gas. So indeed, if you form the exoplanets from from the snow, from the, from the grains, then you have a low C over O ratio. Otherwise, if you have a direct collapse from the gas, then you have a higher one. And what we could measure now is, it's a pretty, a comparably low one of 0.43 solar. And so this means that indeed this, this planet here, better pick B, has formed from core accretion and, and has accreted lots of planetesimal over its formation. But this planetary system is even nicer because there were indications of another planet in the radial velocity. So on the very right side is the figure from Anne-Marie Lacroix's paper. Is the radial velocity on top of the reflex motion of beta pi B. There's an even higher frequency one. So from a more nearby planet, which has not been seen in the direct images. But now with gravity, actually, we could detect it. So this is the beta pic C, which is labeled here in this little green symbols. So this is the first direct detection of a radial velocity planet. So we start to now overlap the techniques between radial velocity planets and direct detection and direct spectroscopy planets. And you can go even farther because the stars are not point-like anymore in the photometry. You resolve them, and so this is lower left figure is from a paper from Stefan Kraus, where he measured the rotation of the star in the spin axis, and he's found that actually this, this accretion disk from the star is aligned still with the spin of the, of the star in the center. To my knowledge, it's the first measurement of this, this kind. And so the resolution here is, again, a few micro arc seconds, a few hundred micro arc seconds. So this were the exoplanets which we had. Let me move to the galactic center black hole. Mm, this is about testing the black hole paradigm, and we talked about it. So this, so we, the, this year's Nobel Prize was, was rewarded to this discovery of the black hole in the center of the galaxy, and to the theory that, that really the formation of black holes is unavoidable if you compress it enough. So this goes to, to Roger Penrose, Andrea Gess, and Rainer Gensel. And so they are the three pillars 
And the three pillars now, let's go to the physics. What do you need to, to test the Plecot paradigm? You need to test three things. You need to test the theory, and you need to measure the mass, and you measure the size. And to all of the three now, this gravity instrument could, could contribute substantially. The measurement of the mass, and this is what you also have seen in Andrea's talk two, two weeks ago in New York Colloquium, and also, and this was also in the paper from Ryder, again, my correlation to that in, in 2002, this one star was falling by, and it makes a very nice orbit, and from the Kaplarian orbit, you can measure the mass. So by now, this is the latest incarnation of that, with the gravity measurements where we can see the star move every day, you get a very precise measurement of the mass. So you have a four million solar masses in there, without doubt. But then you also have, can use this, this measurements of the star orbit to actually check whether the theory is behind general re relativity from Einstein. And we have done already three tests with that. So on the top one, so one of the predictions is, is from the equivalence principle that you have a gravitational redshift. So time goes slower when you get closer to the black hole, which reflects itself in a higher redshift. And on the right side, this is the comparison between the effect expressed in kilometer per seconds over time when you come close to the black hole and the two results by the gravity collaboration and then a year later by the, the UC group, uh, this is the Do it all 19 paper. And with gravity now, we could go even farther because we also see the Schwarzschild precession. The star does not re reside in the same ellipse, but the ellipse is rotating from the GI effect. So you get a kink in the orientation. And so we could now also with gravity actually see this kink in the rotation. And we are in the Schwarzschild precession detected to a, to a five sigma level now. And so this brings me to the last one, which is we need to measure the size. The mass has to be in something which is very small, as small as the event horizon. And historically, this comes from the radio on the top right. You see a parsec scale, and there's a point source, this little hot dot. But even in the radio, there's weather. Indeed, they have space weather. There is interstellar medium, which makes turbulence. And you are not sharp. You get sharper when you go to short, short and shorter wavelengths. And this is shown in the middle plot. So you can measure the size of the central object. What you see, it gets smaller and smaller to shorter wavelength. It's all, all about how sharp we can look through. But then when you get to around a, a 10 Schwarzschild radii, a 5 Schwarzschild radii, actually this is at a millimeter wavelength, or sub-millimeter, you can look through this interstellar turbulence and actually see it's very compact. And with gravity, we could now go even a step further because in our orbit measurements at the top, you see the star and the black hole all the time. So we do not have to make the orbit, again, an unseen object, but we see the, the massive object in the center all the time. And from time to time, it's flaring, and actually we see an orbital motion, 30% of the speed of light, with a size of, a, of 150 micro arc second of the order or less. So this means this 4 million solar masses must really reside in a few Schwarzschild radii. And those brings it together and let me bring to the, to the extragalactic world. Supermassive black holes also exist, and not also, exist everywhere in all galaxies. And indeed, this was the initial motivation of finding the discovery of, of this object, this equator 3C273. It looks point-like, but it's far away. And it, so the only energy source which can be create enough energy are black holes, and so this was the first case. But how do you now measure the mass of such a black hole? This is from a broad line region, so surrounding such a black hole, gas is rotating, and if you could measure the rotation and the speed of this gas, you can get the mass. But this is very small, this is like an outer, outer solar system at a, a billion light years ago, so you have to be very sharp, and this is what we do with gravity, and the measurement box is follow. So you have a spectral line on the top, which is broadened. This is the Doppler velocity of this gas cloud, so a few thousand kilometer per second. And then in the lower part, what we measure in, in the ferrometry is the position of the interference pattern. And so it moves a little bit left and right if the object is a little bit on the left and right. So what you see here now is, and this comes in this next illustration, 
if you scan through the velocities in the spectrum, you actually get a different phase, which means projected on sky is a different position. And so you get a very uh, nice and clear rotation curve from that, which directly gives the mass and gives the size. And then you can go even beyond it. So there's a paper from a Chinese group where you, you can compare this with reverberation mapping. So you have a, a physical size measured in light days, and you have an angular size measured with gravity. If you divide the two, you get the distance. So you get the Hubble constant. And so now this was the one. The other one was is do we understand how this supermassive black holes work? Does this torus exist? So you need images. And, and by now we, we have already two images of these central regions in the middle, this 1068, the top right are unpublished yet on, on 3783. And if you zoom in on, on 1068, so this now a few million arc second resolution, we actually see that the, the K band, the two micron emission is coming from a thin unresolved ring, which is a line probably with this maser disk, which you see here. So it's not at all this, this thick torus which we have in mind from the Antonucci picture. It's, it's very different. And so we are starting to do that for more and more. We already are building up size luminosity relations for about 10 objects or so. But now we want to do more. We want to, well, we want to see all of the black holes and we want to see how black hole formation and galaxy formation are linked. And all of that happens uh, 10 giga years ago. This is called cosmic noon, where there's a peak de facto in all of the formation process. It was the peak when the stars formed, this where most of molecular gas was around, and this is where the massive black holes were creating most. But this is now 10, uh, 10 billion light years ago. Can we do this measurement? And what is here on the left side is actually now from a catalog, all the quasars. You can predict how big would this signature be expressed in decrease. This is in the photometric signature. And the brightness, and depending on the redshift, actually, of course, the objects get fainter, so they go to the right. But what you also see, actually, the signatures do not get smaller. So this is the object I've just shown you, the 273. But indeed, the higher redshift objects have a stronger signature, so they are farther up in the plot. And this comes from the fact that we're actually measuring a line continuum ratio. And what happens is in the local universe, we only have bracket gamma, with, where there's only very little flux compared to the continuum, which is flooded by the, the thermal photons. But when you go to higher redshift, and other lines go into the spectrum. For example, each alpha comes in at a redshift of two, and then each alpha dominates the flux. The continuum is not strong anymore because the thermal part happens at longer wavelengths, and then you get the strong signatures. So what are our limits? They are shown here. So there are two limits. So one is we need to stabilize our interference pattern, and the other one is we need to integrate long enough. This, so these are the vertical and this, this diagonal line. So the first thing, we, we need to get access to all of this object, which for us means French tracking is the equivalent to adaptive optics. And to do that, the objects are too faint, so you need to do adaptive optics or French tracking on nearby stars. It is what we call off-axis tracking and laser guide stars. This is the first thing we want to do with, with this upgrade. And the other one is we want to push the sensitivity limits, and we want to do that with better adaptive optics and by working on the instrument. And so this is this Gravity Plus proposal, which we submitted uh, last year to a conference and then wrote it up for a white paper proposal in, in February. It was looked at the advisory committee of ESO and, and recommended. We already did our internal kickoff in, in August. And so we are looking forward now to start the project together with ESO very soon to do four things. And the first thing is this off-axis French tracking. So this is the equivalent of you can think of it as like adaptive optics on a bright nearby star, only for interferometry. And in, indeed, this was foreseen for interferometry for day one. There's uh, all the hardware is in place actually to bring two stars down to the laboratory. But it, well, the time was not ready when, when this was made. This was uh, 15 years ago for this Prima experiment. 
But now we are putting a little bit more hardware to it. We have a better understanding. And indeed, already last year, we could do two demonstrations where we stabilize the interference pattern on a, on a star, which is, is, is up to 20 arc seconds away. And we've done that with the UTs for the C on the, on the top left. This is interference pattern from a binary star, which we observed. And on the lower part, this is a binary in Orion just to, to check with a little update on the orbit. So the technique works, and this is quickly to implement. So we hope to do science already later next year or, or latest in 22. We want to be get better and more sensitive, and also this is what we've already started. We upgraded the instrument with better prisms, so these are greetings de facto, which now have a factor two to three higher efficiency compared to what I've shown you before, together with our colleagues in, in, in Canada and in ESO, together with a, with a British company, we are de developing new detectors, this uh, photo counting detectors. And already now we, we are at a, at a level where we are factor two better than this, the best detectors available to, today. These are the steletide detectors. So another factor two. And the biggest offender for us is adaptive optics, only for the extragalactic work, but also for the exoplanets. The, the adaptive optics, which we have at the, at the four telescopes for the interferometer, is, is 20 years old, de facto, by concept. And so this is just not the state of the art anymore. So we will put new adaptive optics. You see, we are already in the middle of the the final des the mechanical design of the system. And we want to do it together with lasers such that we have a performance very similar to what you are used from sphere on the high, on the maximum strain performance, but also to go faint, like with the, the laser guide star facility. And last but not least, we, we need laser guide stars because we want to go extra galactic and the objects are not bright enough for themselves to do adaptive optics. And, and laser guide stars are the, the, the the technology of choice for the adaptive optics for fringe tracking, we do not have that solution yet. But actually, it's not so bad because you remember, even with laser guide stars, you cannot measure the tilt of a star because the laser shakes as the turbulence shakes. And, and so you always have to measure the tilt of a star. But if you can measure the tilt of a star, this is actually two degrees of freedom, you can also measure the arrival time of the photons, we call the piston, which is only degree of freedom. And this does not change if you go to larger telescopes. It's indeed, all of the, the adaptive optics gets more and more difficult with large telescopes, but this you do with the laser. But then the rest actually gets easier. You have more photons for the same measurement. And so this is what we, we want to do. And so this, for the example of this extra galactic work, if you take all of this five factor, five, five times a factor, two to four together, you come to this factor 100 for this extra galactic objects, this is five magnitudes. And then you can go back to this diagram and the rest of my presentation, I will talk about what we want to do with gravity. So let's go up to the cosmic noon and measure the sizes and the masses of black holes in the center of galaxies, how they grow and how they how they um, interact or co-evolve co with the galaxies around. And, and actually, we do not have to stop at a redshift of 2.5. You can even go higher, we think. So we've done our first simulation on that, and it really looks feasible. So, so if you go to a redshift of seven, other lines go into the spectrum of the Cape and where we work. So the magnesium two line, this is from, from one of the uh, redshift seven quasars. We move in, and again, because the line to continuum is so strong, we have signatures which are within the range of what we can detect. So we will be able to measure the masses of this massive black holes only a, a, a billion years after the Big Bang, really, and see how they evolve. Then we can address very fundamental questions, for example, this final parsec problem. So this is a figure adapted from, from Begelmann, Blanford, and Tree. So this is when two galaxies merge, the central black holes merge as well. And actually, they can uh, come together quite quickly. And so on the vertical axis, we have the, 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 the relaxation time, so how quickly they can get closer. And you see if the, the black holes are still far apart, there are so many stars around. 
that they can very quickly approach them. This is in this phase, a dynamical friction regime. And it is also goes very quickly in the end when gravitational wave can emit. But in between, it's difficult because there is, are no stars anymore so that you have a dynamical friction and gravitational waves do not, are not emitted yet. And this is called a final parsing problem. How do you overcome that? And do the spidery black holes actually exist? And so the answer is yes, there are not, not many which we know. On the right side, there are the two where we have radio and the photometry imaging of the two. So this is how they look like. So if you come to a resolution of a million arc second, then at this typical redshifts, we talk about this, this final passing problem. So guiding where we can go with gravity. And then what is what it what uh, what you expect and see what you see on the left side. So you have what you will have is the black holes will still agree. You have a circum binary disk with gas streams of gas going in and then mini disks around the black hole. So this is right on top of, of what, what gravity is made to measure, like before with the broad line region. And indeed now you can have two scenarios and I'm showing plots from a, from a Chinese group around uh, Shangshen and uh, on the left side and on the right side one from our group from, from Jason Dexter. So if you have this case that both black holes agree, you have a dual broad line region, this is what can lead to this double line profiles in, in the broad line, which is shown here, the top line is the spectrum. And if you have really two broad line counter rotating, for example, um, uh, co-rotating or depending, whatever, choose your object, then you will get a very clear signature in what we've measured in this position velocity diagram. The lower part is the interferometric part, the upper part is the spectroscopic part, and you get the velocity profile as you see it up there. But more likely is probably that not both of them are creating, but that one is dominating, and then the situation is different. This is what you see on the right side. Indeed, you will only have a, a single broad line region on one of the black holes, and then the continuum emission is the, the dust which is uh, surrounding the two together. So the, the dust you use as a, as a ruler, as a center of gravity, and then you measure now the, the position velocity diagram of something which is offset to a center of the continuum. And this is what we already see in one of the galaxies in the nearby universe. And we are very confident that we can also now see this in, in binary black holes. So you would see an astrometric gradient if you have a rotation here relative measure to, to the dust continuum. But we not only want to go far away, you want to also get close to, to the exoplanets. And we want to go to the, to the Jupiters and rocky planets. So let me introduce a little bit, and I'm, I'm using here a few slides from a, a presentation our team member Silvestre has given a few weeks ago at the Joint Munich Colloquium. So this is the, the overview of the known planets. So right now we, we know a, a few thousand of that order. And they come mainly from three techniques. They come from the transit, shown in blue, from radial velocities in orange, and from direct imaging with adaptive optics in green. And the two axes which you see here is on the vertical side the mass in half masses, and on the horizontal side is the, the semi-major axis in astronomical units. And what really where we want to go is to solar system-like objects. And I, I plot three of the objects you are familiar with. This is where Earth would look, uh, sit in this diagram, and where Jupiter and Saturn would look, sit in this diagram. And you see we are not there yet. The techniques are not made to detect them. It will go slowly. We will go there with astrometry from Gaia and with the radial velocity and with the transit. But right now, we are not there. So the question is, do we have actually a chance? And there are two questions. So are there objects in this regime at all? And, and if so, can we detect them? Well, the first question is probably yes. So this is a population synthesis of as far, everything what we know about planetary system. The color code is the temperature of the planets in this diagram for the, the next, I think, 30 parsec what we've done the simulation. So indeed, there are more than enough objects if you only have the sensitivity, can we detect them? And so to this question, let me actually go to a, 
to, uh, to a different uh, way of looking on it. So I'm now changing the axis, not fundamentally, but a bit. So instead of the, the physical distance in astronomical units, I go into an angular separation, so projected separation on the horizontal axis. And on the vertical axis, we go into a, um, a parameter, which is the, the contrast between the star and the planets. So the, the faint small planets are down here, the big ones are up there. And so again, when you see the radial velocities in orange sit here, the, the transits are the, the, this, this light blue ones, the directly imaged are the green ones, and the ones where we want to go is all of this, where the, the color code is the temperature. And with gravity in, in the O and the spectroscopy, where we already here is in this regime, where the green ones are. And indeed, the O didn't come out of that. We, we don't have the sensitivity and the contrast in the O. But with gravity, we have already seen this, this beta pic C. So we already pushed the detection limit by an order of magnitude, both getting closer in. And, and getting fainter, but we want to go here. And we want to go here, down here, how far can you go? And so now let's plot two very fundamental lines which give the physical limits. So the, the one is how faint the object you can see before you come into the thermal background of the observatory. So we observe it in the cave and the two micron. So, so you can go, so it, we, we look at a black body of 300 Kelvin and this is the noise equivalent, this horizontal line. The vertical line is the angular resolution of our, our interferometer, 3 million seconds. So you see, actually, indeed, we, we can detect all of them. So it's not a matter of fundamental physics, but it's a man, matter of building the instrument right. And, and so now what means instrument right? Well, there's more than just background and resolution, and there's photon noise. And photon noise for us comes from the star. And so now you see here, uh, look on the dotted line on the top, so it's the same diagram. These are planets we, which we want to reach, so these are off and Jupiter Mars planets. And, and now what you see in the dotted line, this is the, the noise from the scattered photons from the from the central star. And what you see here is the early pattern. So whenever you are in the first early ring, this is at a, a 60 milli arc second with a single telescope, then you can, in the dark early ring, you can go down. And, but on average, this is the adaptive optics limit, this dotted line. Now with interferometry, because we, we, we can actually now have what I try to describe as a login amplifier. We can very easily distinguish between photons which come from the star. They are still here from the adaptive optics leftovers from the ones from the planet. So we, we get in the contrast boost and this is now the, the contrast curve in, in, the, in interferometry, this is the red line. And you see we we are getting there to already now to, to this regime, and this is what we want to do, and where we want to improve. And improving in the ferrometry means you, you need to have a better fringe contrast, better fringe tracking, better control loops, better adaptive optics to start with. And so in the end, what we want to target is, indeed is now, I'm going back to the initial representation, is, is where the solar system planets sit around here. This is where we want to dive in with gravity class. And, and if we take the, our models, you would say we can reach about 20 to 50 of these this planets in this region here. And then we can do spectroscopy and of the atmosphere of these planets. But you can also do other things. And, and so, for example, microlensed images, microlenses. So this is when a dark object goes in front of a, a background object. You see two, two, two times the background object. This very small, uh, for, for Einstein, this was point like this, a milli arc second is the scale. But now in 19, uh, a group around Don could actually with gravity for the first time measure, resolve this lens image. So you get two, you, you can measure diameter, in this case, two milli arc second. And why is it so important? It is so important, and this is shown now in the middle one, this is an other paper from, from Zhang et al, also with gravity and with Spitzer data. If you, in addition, get the, the parallax of the, the lensed image, 
you can fully determine what is the mass of the lens even if you don't see the lens. And this is exactly what you want to do if you want to probe the, 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 the baryonic, well, the compact dark uh, matter candidates like, like, uh, like the crows. And indeed, this, the first measurement was done in this combination of, of Spitze and VLTI. And now you can look forward what will come in the future. And, and so on the left side is a prediction. Where do you see the black holes? And you see the black holes when the, 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 the lensing events are a few hundred days long, then black holes will dominate. And then you can enter this regime. So this is the, the gravitational wave population of black holes. These are typically so far by observational bias, um, massive black holes but sometimes too massive for the, for the taste of many, many of our of us, uh, astronomers. And, and so this is what we will, will do by, by measuring the population, the mass distribution of, of black holes from microlensing to compare to what our gravitational wave people get. And then we can come back to the, to the galactic center black hole and, and continue our things. And, and what we want is, we want to fundamentally test general relativity. And, and so this is a, a very simplified description of how you can deviate. The Schwarzschild radius could be smaller than the one from predicted by GR and the deviation described as epsilon, or what we describe as a, the Lohr theorem, the spin, of the, the spin and the quadrupole moment of the black hole are not directly related to each other. A is the spin, Q the quadrupole moment, but there's also deviation. And so right now we are of this order unity in the measurements which we have from, from the motion of the gas close to the ISCO, from the image of, of, of M87 from the Event Horizon Telescope, a little bit better, but not much from the gravitational wave. So to really make the next steps, we want to directly measure the spin, and for that we need a fainter star. And, and we, we were hoping that there is a 90 magnitude star from the density profiles. We have a 90 magnitude star. There's a paper which was, was an astro page to uh, a week ago. So we, we can see stars which are 90 magnitude here, 20 million seconds away from the, the central black hole. But this is a star which is actually moving very slowly, so it's only close in projection, but not physically close. So we will continue. And so this is the timeline for gravity, and, and de facto also the end of my talk is so. So we have three steps we want to implement. So number one is we want to have the off-axis fringe tracking, because this opens up all of the the, not all, but a large part of the faint sky, because you can use a nearby bright star to stabilize the fringe. The next one, which will take a little bit longer, three years, is to, to equip all of the telescope with new adaptive optics. So this will bring the, the boost then in, in, in the AGN and especially in the exoplanet business, because this AO is really, really so much better than the one which we have. And then other year later, we you hopefully will arrive at laser guides that's for all of the telescopes. So we'll also equip UD123 to then really open up the extra galactic sky. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention and give the word back to you, really. Thank you very much, Frank. Very nice talk. I enjoy a lot. And now the talk is open for questions. Uh, the questions uh, will be managed by Reiner. I think uh, you can ask yourself, raising your hand, or you can write it down in the chat box. Uh, Reiner, please. Yes, so Frank, thank you very, very much uh, for this fantastic talk. I mean, you should all be aware, I think, as far as I know, Frank is the only person who understands each and every subsystem of, of, of gravity. No, I don't understand anything. <laughs> just to, to make it clear. Well, okay, yeah, that's that's what I have heard once from ESO, and so it's it's really the most complicated thing and complex instrument ever built. So my congratulations again to you, Frank, to to Reinhardt, who is still here. So I'm I'm very happy about all of this. this is a fantastic development. And yes, and I think it's really, I mean, as you have been demonstrating in the group from MPE, it's really the instruments that push the field extremely forward. 
So um, let's ask for, go for questions. Um, you can either raise your hand or go directly. Um, yeah, raise your hand or type them in the chat, please. I need to find everyone chat. Are there no questions so far? Yeah, Isabel, raise your hand. Okay, Isabel, yes. There you go. Just a comment. First of all, just to congratulate you for such a, a, a I mean, a complete and an extraordinary talk. It's a, I've been very, very surprised at the capacity of gravity, um, mostly because of the uh, what you're t talking about, the possibilities for the extragalactic sky. So that's great. And um, but but I but I take profit just to as a scientific director of the program, just to invite you in person when all this situation will will be over, okay? So we'll be grateful yeah, to have you here in person at the IAA. So I extend this invitation online to the to the truth, to the real one. And thank you very much, Frank. Thank you very much. I have a question. So you say the, the collaboration is still growing. Are you still open for people to come to bring in money? I guess always, right? Or big question? I would say always. Actually, from the financing, we are already quite well prepared, but more could help. So we have a very good funding from the Max Planck Society or the Betty McCrant, it also from the Max Planck Foundation. So this is a private foundation which supports the Max Planck Society. And the new director in Heidelberg, Laura, has made it part of our startup funds to join Gravity. And the French are also ramping up. So things are, are good, but indeed we, we could also need a, um, more money and we could need people to join us in the scientific exploration. So you see we have already opened up, so Sebastian Hoening is not an experimental group, so he joined for his interest on the extragalactic work in the supermassive black holes. On the exoplanets we, we have the need Freer, so this is the ones who want to go to maximum contrast to get to the, the most nearby planets. So yes, we, we are open. And if you bring a million, highly appreciate it. Yeah, and push the science. Great. That is great. Uh, are there any more questions? I'm or has everybody been blown away? Yes, Pepa. Josefa Masegosa from the IAA. Hello, thank you, Frank, for this very impressive. Uh, very impressive special you have shown with gravity. I knew some of the some of the new the new findings you are getting. Uh, well I am I work in the in after galactic nuclei, nearby after galactic nuclei. Um, I would like to know your opinion about the gravity the gravity data on NDC 1068, if it, this data confirm uh, the system of uh, Torus or, or the alternative model of uh, some, some kind of wind. So what, what do you think about this data? The wind we do not see, so I can go back to the picture. Let me see, give me one second, please. To pick the slide. So this is the picture what we see when you zoom in. So what we see, so what we observe at two microns. So this is the hot dust, which is the inner rim of the dust region, which is illuminated and heated by the black hole. And so what we clearly see is with, with, a, with a diameter of about 10 milli arc second, for us in a height unresolved ring of emission. So we integrate this, this is the, the subdivision um, radius of the dust region. The dust region for us is thin. So it's not the, the thick Antonucci torus as you would envision it. And it also makes, so it's thin and it's very dense, which, which you would also now See, it matches the Mesa disk, which was measured before, so it is not our data, but this is 
is the mesa in which you can see the rot rotation velocity in color and the position of the mesa this each aligns very nicely with with this with this thin ring thin ring of hot dust which we see to for, for the black hole is the outflow well what you see here there is this out oh excuse me let me see if i can so there oh. is this there is this outflow cone which you see at larger scales in the integral field spectroscopic data, for example. In gravity, we do not see so much of this outflow coming. We see it in other objects, in other AGN, in 1068. Not what we also see, and this is something which our Matisse colleagues, which observe at longer wavelengths, see, is a, is a source here about 20 milli arc second to the to the south, so we didn't put much attention in our image in the paper, but this actually has a substantial flux now at, at, at longer wavelengths, so there's a lot of warm dust over there, which could be linked to this, to this outflow. I don't know whether it helped, I'm not really an AGN person, maybe my colleague should comment. Yeah, okay, thank you. But I think that uh, gravity will contribute a lot uh, to this uh, to this dispute about uh, the system of the, the detection in the infrared or not of the of the torus or even the system of the torus because uh, we think that maybe it depends on luminosity. Uh, maybe the torus are more often at uh, lower luminosity, so that is. Uh, is, is an incredible device to to analyze all these problems. So thank you. <laughs> you are the, you're asking the wrong person. Unfortunately, I don't feel comfortable here. In in, in my little view, the, the torus picture doesn't match what I see with the instrument. So for me, it's not this torus which we we know from the animation. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you for 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 giving up to this, this uh, wonderful talk. Thank you. Rainer, you have your micro off. Thank you. Paco Najarro has a question. Hi, Frank. Uh, Great talk. Uh, I was wondering one of the open, big open questions for very for massive stars is the most massive star one can form, and one of the best places to look that is still at a big debate is in the core of R136, and there are uh, some results from its sphere that uh, they are not conclusive. But I wonder whether gravity, now that I've been proofs also in the how deep it can go in terms of of uh, I, uh, I say uh, magnitudes that could provide a much better approach and a, a final solution into breaking up the the components of of the of the core and the core of the cluster. Mm -hmm. You are raising a very important point, and indeed we have started a program. So this Joel Sanchez, Wolfgang Brandner. The Heidelberg team also with us to, to look on in GC3603 and the central stars here. Uh, we, we had two observations a, a year ago and it, the, the weather conditions were not very good. I think we have some data, but not yet the data which would really help us to, to for example, measure orbits of the stars or even see whether they, they break down into to multiple stars, the ones which are uh, unresolved with, with sphere. Yeah, yeah, that, that's so interesting because we know those are binaries, but uh, the for, for the special this this place in the in the LMC, we would still we still don't know whether whether they're binaries and one of them stands as the record holder for the most massive single star known. And uh, if you ask the community, it could range between anything between 150 or 350 solar masses. So I guess that gravity for that purpose could be could go much, much further than a sphere, I guess, um, if, if you say so. Uh, absolutely. I, so the reason I think why we didn't come so far yet, so this is with the, the big telescopes, with the UTs, which are expensive observations, and so, so we didn't invest so much time yet. 
but absolutely this is the way we want to go and, and hopefully then repeat the same what what Weigel has done for, for Dorados <laughs> 30 years ago to come to break the, the two massive star down in less massive stars. Yeah, yeah that would be really, really nice. And it's a very, uh, very strong also pointing to these very massive star business and whether, whether when you go to lower metallicity, you tend to form more massive stars. And yeah, so as a question also for the first stars would be very interesting. This, this could also then come with gravity plus. So for the moment, we cannot go to, to arc 136 in the Rados, So this is not yet within reach. But now with the laser guide stars and with the off axis, we, we hopefully can also go to the Magellanic clouds to, to different metallicity. Mm -hmm. Perfect, thanks. Other questions? think not. So we are well over an hour. Um, so I would really like to thank again uh, Frank for his willingness to jump in on such short notice and for a really talk that shows you what's coming up in great revolutions. And uh, I would like to thank everybody for attending this seminar. Thank you very much again, all of you. If there is no other question, I think we can now stop the recording and I will give it back to René.